So, storage of secrets. This is not a really technical talk, it's more of a user's viewpoint. The technical details are a bit obscure. But anyway, our, as you know, our main way of storing things in GNOME is with seahorse. But you never really see the string seahorse anywhere. It's just the name of the binary, it's the name of the program. But everywhere else we identify it as passwords and keys. So it may be a bit strange for users to read that they have to administer their passwords and keys using seahorse if they never see the string seahorse anywhere in the screen. Uh, there's a few use cases I want to talk about for storing passwords and sharing them around. One example is my wife and I have a joint bank account. And, uh, you know, we need a shared hearing with a few passwords we like to share. You know, the bank password, the Netflix password, very important. Um, what other stuff? Bank, Netflix. Uh, maybe the, our family YouTube channel, which is just shared among members of the family, things like that. So how would you do that in Seahorse or passwords and keys? This is the thing a, a new user sees when they first start Seahorse for the first time, like on an empty home directory. So a new user may think, OK, I have some things on the left. And if I click on one of those, the right side is going to show what I have in there. Presumably, since I just started it for the first time, it's showing up as empty. And even if it's empty, uh, it would be nice to give the user a hint as what they can do, you know? It's a plus sign up there, so maybe that's the first thing to do. But anyway, it's kind of a bad experience that the very first time you run this, one of the strings doesn't fit, where it says user key store hash right there, and it doesn't fit. Uh, that, that's easy to fix. OK, so. The first time you start playing around with the program, you get the view menu and you see an option, a toggle, which says by keyring. So you can be view things by keyring. What happens if we turn that off on the very first time you run the program? You get this. You get a bunch of no passwords or keys or certificates? We are not sure because, oh, it says certificates there. What are certificates? All that kind of stuff, you know? So anyway, what are those? Are those default certificates created for so that I can use them or something? Let's look at one of those. I right click on one. I cannot delete it. So I hit properties and get an empty window that is not centered on the main one. It's like out there. So that, that's, that's getting pretty. OK, maybe Seahorse is not advanced enough to show me the contents of those null certificates. So, so what if we hit the export certificate button up there? What happens? I get a file chooser so that I can uh, type a file name. But if I look at that, it turns to be, it turns out to be, where's my mouse? It's a zero byte file with a that's not that bad these days. On a more positive note, other users are not allowed to see my empty file. So, you know. Anyway, let's go back to the main window and let's try clicking on the plus item to see what the hell I can do with this thing. Maybe I want to create my, my new shared keyring for my for my for myself. So when you hit plus, you get this dialogue. This is the very first time we see the string seahorse in the screen. 
And if you are an X11 programmer, you'll know that this happens because this is the name of the binary and it gets shown in the window title because the programmer who wrote Seahorse did not actually specify a title for that window. So by default, it gets the binary's name. That's really bad, you know? Anyway, we, we, the user sees that they can create a few things. They can create a new keyring for passwords, which is exactly what I was looking for. A PGP key, okay. A private key, which is used to request a certificate. Okay, technical people should know, may know what that means. An SSH key, or I can create a password from here. But I don't want to create a password. I, give, I want to create a key ring that I can share with my spouse to keep our shared passwords. Anyway, let's try doing that. So I select that, create a new password key ring. I get prompted for a key ring name. So I'll just type in shared with my spouse, enter. And when I hit enter, nothing happens. The text entry is bound to the button when you hit enter. Also, the OK and cancel buttons, they should be reversed per the GNOME standards, right? Uh, anyway, so I click on the OK button and the keyring gets created, but it does not get selected and the name is not made to fit, right? So those are the little, the little things that turn a potentially good UI into a very clumsy one. So anyway, if we select it, uh, there's no indication here in the right pane of what to do next. So. We could have a little label here that says, this keyring is empty. Click here to add a new password. Okay, so let's click plus again. We get the same dialog again with no title, no title bar. And okay, so I'll select to create a stored password because you know I want to save my bank's password in there. So, okay, continue. And I get this dialog. It asks me which keyring I want to use to put my key. It does not select the keyring I'm actually viewing by default. That's really sloppy. Here I can type the, what the password is about. Here I can actually type the password. And you'll see, you'll start to see a few inconsistencies like, uh, Let's go back a bit. Uh, this has OK and cancel in the wrong position. This has cancel and continue in the right position. But presumably, since it's a two-step two process, it doesn't just say OK, it says continue. This could be a GTK, you know, the multi-pane dialog kind of thing. Here we have OK and cancel in the wrong place again. So anyway, I fill in this dialog. I select the right keyring, which could, could have been selected for default. I type bank password, type in my password, hit OK. And when I do that, my password appears three times in the list. I don't know what happens. That's clearly a bug. If I delete one of these, all of them that get deleted. So it's probably just showing them by tri in triplicate. Also, if I, this is my shared with my spouse keyring up there, right? But if I click on my login keyring, my bank password appears twice. If I delete one from there, all of them are gone. The five of them are gone, right? So that, that's clearly a bug. It, it shows that people, are not really testing this, which is fine because the whole program is so clumsy. You know, it's not their fault. Anyway, uh, maybe we could change the name. In, in, in addition to fixing all the things I've been describing, 
We could probably change the, the name of the login keyring. The login keyring is the one that gets created for you by default. It gets unlocked. Keyrings can be locked with an extra password so that no one else can access the password, the passwords within a certain keyring. The login keyring is unlocked with your login password when you when you initiate your session. So call that default keyring or your global keyring or your personal keyring. I'm not sure. It's not clear to me what login means there for, for regular users. Then, okay, let's look at uh, a bit more at the internals. After a bit of looking around in my hard drive, I find the keyring files. They're stored in .local share keyrings. I have my login keyring, all right. I have the shared with my spouse keyring and a user key store. I think this is for, for certificates. I'm not sure yet. So I run the file command to see what's inside my shared with my spouse dot keyring. And it says, okay, predictably, predictably enough, it's a GNOME keyring, version number created this time, not locked if idle, right? So presumably there's a flag in there in the keyrings that says that if I leave my computer sitting around, that keyring should be locked with a password so that if a coworker or someone goes and messes around with my machine, they cannot look at my bank password that I shared with my wife. That, that sounds useful. So let's see if we can find a place to, to turn that on, to make it automatically if my computer is idle. So I go back to my seahorse window. I right click on, on my keyring's name and I get this menu. Set as default, uh, change the password. I guess that's the password used to lock the keyring. I, I never set one, so presumably this is empty. Lock, that seems useful. But properties, because I really want to change that it should be locked automatically when my computer is idle. So I hit properties and I get this dialog. Okay, maybe the application is so sloppy that it's one of those windows that is shrunk all the way and you must make bigger before you can use it. Let's try making it bigger. It's actually empty. There's nothing there, there's just a close button, which works. But I cannot change any properties uh, in my keyring, even though there's clearly a property somewhere to keep it locked if I if I'm not using my computer. At this point, I, I just gave up, you know? But, well, I took the trouble of saving my bank password there, which is actually a useful thing to have. I'm confident that it's being stored uh, encrypted in my hard drive, you know, so that uh, if my laptop gets stolen, nobody will be able to read my bank's password. Anyway, so how do I transfer this to... Where's my mouse again? Uh, no mouse. Okay, it seems, okay, here's my mouse. How do I transfer my password to, to a website for when I access my bank? So there's no button here or anything that says copy the password to the clipboard or somehow transfer it to the bank website. So, okay, I'll hit properties and you'll see that delete is the first menu item there. Delete a password is clearly not the first thing you want to do with it. You know, it's not the most important. It should not be the most important command there. I know by convention properties is the last thing you put on a context menu, but this is this this seems rather special. So I wonder if delete should really not be the first item there. Okay, so this is the properties window I get for my stored password. Again, there's no indication here of how I might transfer it to to the web browser. So, 
let's open the password expander here. Okay, get what I expected, the usual dots. But selecting this does not work. If you select the dots in a password entry, you cannot actually copy them to the clipboard. I have to hit show password, which defeats the whole purpose of having a password manager, because if someone is looking over my shoulder, they now have my bank's password when I want to use it. The, the whole idea of keeping the dots in there is that I can copy the password somewhere to the clipboard and nobody can see it in, in, you know, in transit. So that was for a new user account with an empty home directory. Now, let me tell you a little story. I've been carrying my home directory around from desktop computer to laptop to laptop to new desktop to new laptop. And my home directory is really old. And I was looking at where my key, my passwords are stored in Seahorse. For example, all my Evolution email account passwords are actually stored there because that's what Evolution uses. They are not stored into dot uh, local share keyrings. They are still stored in my .gnome2 directory, which I've been wanting to blow away for a long time because I don't really use any GNOME2 applications anymore, but they are still there. They didn't get migrated for some reason. Maybe there's no code to do that. And uh, Evolution must be doing something the old way. Because even though some of these are relatively new accounts or I re-entered them into evolution, it's not putting in a description here on the right-hand side. Uh, for example, it actually took the trouble of saying, hey, this is, a pass this is a telepathy password, you know? It should say here, this is an email account password or this is a, a Google Calendar password from evolution, you know? Anyway, and I also get this strange entry here on their certificates, which says GNOME 2 key storage. And if I look at my .gnome2 slash keyrings, there's a mysterious file there with certificates that I have no idea what, what I'm doing there. Uh, my, as I said, my main keyring, the ones I, the one I use every day for evolution accounts, is in .gnome2 slash keyrings. And in that same directory, there's, okay, my big login keyring with the, with the evolution passwords. There's a certificate I created for testing purposes at some point, and for some reason it got stored here instead of the new location that we use in GNOME 3. This user.keystore file, which seems, you know, pretty empty, the, the, the stuff in the certificate. So I wonder what that's about. Also, if I run the file command again on my personal login keyring, where my evolution passwords are, which I change all the time because I, when I was looking at this, I took the time to delete a few really obsolete passwords from ICQ and that kind of shit. Uh, the file command is lying. It says last modified March 26, 2008. Even though I had just deleted some passwords, some obsolete passwords from that file. So either this refers to, you know, the creation time of the file and, and it's not modified by Seahorse when, when deleting passwords or something's wrong with the file format. Anyway, this does not give me a lot of confidence. Anyway, that's a chunk of the Berlin Wall. This is a diagram of GNOME Keyring Daemon, as it comes to the GNOME Keyring Daemon documentation. I'm not even sure if it's still accurate. Seahorse is down here. This is the user visible part. Seahorse uses the library, which has, it has a few, it has a GTK widget that applications can use to show the information for a, for a certificate. 
like the ones you would use for a for a LS website. And uh, for example, Evolution uses a widget when when showing you the information about the cert. Uh, sub library. Uh, SDG store the GNOME to store. I'm, I'm not even sure if this is still accurate. Anyway, it comes with the with the GNOME curing documentation. Now, 2016, people have learned much better how to deal with their passwords. There's good recommendations available on the web of what the right thing, pardon me, is to do for storing passwords. One should use a password manager. Okay. Uh, you should use automatically generated random passwords instead of inventing them of your own because then they are harder to brute force. Uh, there's some very good software for doing that. Uh, there is proprietary software like uh, LastPass or Password. What's it called? Password One. One Password. Yeah, One Password. Uh, there is free software for that. There's KeePass and KeePass X, which seems to be standard-ish on Linux systems. Firefox has its own password storage, which works out of the box and uh, it does some very nice things. You don't need to configure it and later select to keep your password stores encrypted. But the really magic thing today is Firefox Sync. Firefox Sync is a thing where you can uh, register yourself on the on the Mozilla website and say, I want to be able to sync, to keep my bookmarks, Firefox settings, web browsing history in sync across multiple devices. That's really useful. For example, I use it at home. I have two desktop machines and one or two laptops. And uh, I tend to use one of those machines for work purposes and one of them for personal purposes. But of course, it all gets blurry. Sometimes I use my work machine for editing OpenStreetMap because it's the one with the bigger screen, useful for maps. So I, I really want my passwords for the OpenStreetMap website to be in sync across both machines. Or if I start reading some documentation, some, sometimes I open GNOME documentation in my other machine because it's the one with the other monitor and, and type some code in my work machine because that's where I like to code, right? So it, it gets fuzzy, but it's very useful with Firefox Sync to be able to keep the, my bookmarks and my passwords synchronized. Uh, Seahorse could clearly help with that. Uh, uh, as we saw in the insurance lightning talks, there's, there's a project to, to share the Epiphany passwords with Firefox Sync. So we might be able to do the same for other password storages that we have. Uh, It might be useful if Seahorse or the password manager we end up using would suggest some best practices for people who are not familiar with computer security. Uh, the, very, the very first time I used Seahorse, I sort of knew that you could create different keyrings, but I didn't realize I had very modest needs at the time. You know, I just needed to store my, my, my personal passwords and I made no distinction between my work and personal things. Uh, you know, as time passed and I got more aware of how computer security should really be done, well, it, they, they say you should try to keep things as compartmentalized as possible. So that, for example, if a uh, naughty coworker snoops into your machine, they might get only access to your work passwords, but they, they won't get access to your personal uh, secrets like your Facebook account or your Twitter account or any other things. Uh, nowadays in my town in Mexico, I'm part of a small activist group to fight for pedestrian rights. We push the city government to, you know, ensure that we don't have or 
power poles in the middle of the sidewalk to ensure that there are, there are ramps for for bikes and uh, to ensure that instead of building expensive pedestrian bridges that are hard to climb, disabilities that are, you know level street level street level crossings things like that, and we have found the need to have some shared passwords among us. You know, there's a, our activist group has a Twitter account and a YouTube account and a Gmail account and this and that. And the members of the group who who have access to those, well, they, they all need to have the password. Unfortunately, these web services don't have a scheme to allow multiple people to access the same uh, account in a clean way. Unlike, for example, WordPress. WordPress, you can create a blog or a website and say, these are the people that can have their own access and they don't know anything about each other's passwords, and that's really nice. So, uh, other things we need to be able to do with uh, our password manager is, as I said, carry passwords across multiple devices, sync them. We already talked about Firefox Sync. Uh, we should probably suggest to people when they actually uh, want to share their key rings. For families, I already talked about that. Oh, the, the password. Now that our daughter, our the, the school where our daughter goes, they made everyone install an app in their smartphone, and that's where you get notifications for, hey, this, there's a test next week or hey you need to bring such and such materials for the school play or whatever and uh, they gave us pre-made usernames and four letter passwords and i think it uses plain http it, it's horrible but anyway we need to keep those four little passwords in sync uh, Activist groups need to share passwords among the members. And reducing the boss factor. For people who are not familiar with the boss factor, the boss factor of something is how many people take to be run over by a boss for the project to completely go to hell, you know? Uh, if only one sysadmin in your activist group knows how to administer their computer resources and that person unfortunately gets hit by a boss you are screwed you know you don't you no longer have access to that so sharing key rings is useful to, redu to reduce the boss factor if you have a boss factor of one and that person disappears for some reason you're in trouble if your boss factor is two then two people have the credentials so you know you are safer don't put them in the same airplane or, or things like that uh, Seahorse also allows you more or less to manage GPG and SSH identities. Uh, it's getting very obsolete these days. SSH has evolved, GPG has evolved. Uh, there's GP GPG1 and GPG2, and Seahorse is not completely happy with GPG2. Uh, we, we should really make it easier for people to have multiple SSH IDs. Uh, up, up until recently, I only had one SSH key for myself, which I used for everything. It's the key I use for my git.gnome.org account. It's the key I use for my machines at home. Uh, but now that, for example, my employer, SUSE, go, got a special... I guess they got into an agreement with GitHub, so we now have SUSE accounts on GitHub. I, I didn't want to use my GNOME uh, SSH key for my SUSE GitHub account, so I created a, another SSH, SSH key, and it's a big pain in the ass to select which one to use when I want to, like, git clone or git push something. I, there is some command line magic you need to do, and we should really make that easier. Uh, whenever there is an SSH operation that needs to go on, we could very well prompt the user, hey, you have multiple keys, which one do you want to use? You know, evolution and, and GPG recently uh, is Jean Francois here. Yes, there you are. Uh, Jean Francois filed a bug against evolution. If you get a GPG signed message 
into evolution. And you actually have the public key for that person, but you have not signed the key. You, it means that you have not verified that that key is actually genuine, that that's the key from the actual person you think it is from. And evolution tells you, uh, what does it tell you? It tells, There is a signature, but it cannot verify the sender. Okay, which is technically accurate, but it doesn't really give the user a clue of what to do to fix that. It could tell you, uh, are you sure this key belo actually belongs to that person? You might want to, you know, call them up and have them read you your, their fingerprint. I don't know, something like that. There's yeah yes. Also, when you look at a GPG key in Seahorse, you get the two things that GPG supports. You can sign the key, or you can change the trust you have in the key. And I'm not completely sure if the trust is actually meaning the trust value is actually meaningful if you have not signed the key maybe it is maybe it's not but evolution really wants you to have the key signed in order to for the trust to work which sort of makes sense but it should tell you why um, i just got told the other day by uh uh by spitler one of the old timers in GNOME, he, he knows his way around GPG and this stage really well, that uh, Seahorse is not happy with new style SSH keys which use elliptic curve cryptography. And uh, Seahorse has trouble uh, syncing the, the display of the SSH keys you have when you modify them in the command line, even though the SSH uh, infrastructure can really tell you about that. Uh, there is no support for smart cards. It, uh, people with higher needs for security don't want to keep their SSH keys inside their hard drive. They ra they'd rather keep it in a smart card, which they only plug in when they need to authenticate and take it out later. We need to support that. Um, also, the SSH agent, the graphical thing that prompts you for your SSH passphrase uh, it's really obsolete as done by Seahorse and the GNOME infrastructure. We, we should really be using the upstream agent and update our stuff or just remove it altogether. Uh, it makes it hard to have multiple SSH keys and things like that. Uh, finally, Flatpak. One of the exciting things about Flatpak is that since applications that are sandboxed with Flatpak do not have access to your to the files in your home in your home directory. That means that if you download a rogue application, it will not be able to get to your key materials. It will not be able to read your passwords, your SSH keys, your GPG keys, unless you give them explicit permission. We have to fix a few th a few things. Uh, this is not from a Flatpak application. This is from. I guess evolution, it doesn't really say. Every now and then on my work machine, I get this dialog box. It doesn't say which program wants to use my password for which account. It clear, I, I'm pretty sure it refers to one of my valid like uh, Gmail or Google Calendar accounts because it's the only thing I keep in evolution, but it doesn't tell me what. It doesn't tell me which application it comes from, and uh, I just hit cancel every time, and I don't know where that's coming from. It's really bad. But anyway, uh, if this were a rogue application inside Flatpak, uh, I would be confident that at least it's not able to get to my key material. Anyway. There, 
on the good news side of things, there's a summer of code project to make it easier to change sign GPTs for key signing parties or for when you meet someone in person and want to exchange public keys. Uh, we saw the summer of code project to finish epiphany with sync. We could use the same infrastructure to share uh, whole key rings from Seahorse. And uh, Michael Catanzaro just told me that uh, Daiki Wano, that's the right name? Daiki Wano is doing a Seahorse rewrite. And I was not aware of that. So hopefully we'll see some good work along those lines. So don't start fixing Seahorse right away because it's being rewritten. And uh, hopefully we'll get some good news about that soon. And uh, mm, that's all I have. Yes. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, Steph Walter here used to be the maintainer of Seahorse, so I'm very sorry if it feels like I'm dumping a lot of shit on you. But so my question is: I've been unable to put much time to GNOME, apparent as you can see, for I don't know three, four years. And, but I have remained the maintainer of these things, which is to say I merge the patches that you and other people write. Um, is that holding people back from rewriting it completely, from changing it? This is an honest question, how to move forward from here so we're not talking about this again. If me being the maintainer and merging the patches and reviewing them is holding people back, then come and talk to me and I'd be happy to work with you to take over some parts, rewrite them, put them in different projects, however you want to move forward. So I, what I really don't want to be is the guy sitting down and making things not happen. And if that's the case, then let me know. Thank you. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I'd like to see what uh, Daiki is doing. And maybe, I don't know, maybe it's to do it by parts, something like that, yeah. Thank you for maintaining it all that time, by the way. You know, when before things evolved so much, it, it, was, it was pretty useful. Rewrites G As everyone rewrites GTK, rewrites Glade, <laughs> rewrites Vala 15 times, and all yeah, of those things, you yeah. can see the dialogue disappears and no one notices, no one cares until Federico finds it. So that's, that's, that's the reality of software in a project like this, right? As we all adjust things and rewrite things, each other part has to be active and kind of keeping up, and that's not the case here. So let me know if there's anything I can change to help you not feel like running away. But Daiki's work is really good, and I, 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 I really hope it works, uh, especially for the password storage case. And for Flatpak, um, this, the idea that's been circulating around is the fact that a central password database is very counter to how people think about storing their stuff uh, in sandbox applications, storing their configuration in sandbox applications. And something like sync makes way more sense between the sandbox applications and a central store across devices, not on your one device. So keep that in mind. And the whole idea of this password database and GNOME keyring and these things, they're really up for completely new ideas. And, but sure, if there's patches, I, I'm ready to merge them at any point. That's basically my level uh, of interaction at this point, is put a patch in and I will work on it with you. All right. Uh, I don't know if all of you have seen, but there are really nice mockups of the things that have been started being implemented by Ueno, I don't know how to pronounce. Taiki Ueno, and that looks like a really good direction, even though it seems to be implemented more as a prototype than as a patch for Seahorse. And also, um, there is this question that's being discussed in the book about the rewrite and the new mockups, should Seahorse be or not a 
personal password manager that you can use for the things you describe, like having a central password and special password for each website or account? And should this be done in Seahorse or not? And I think it looks like it's the time to discuss that before it's written. And I really sh think that the GNOME desktop would deserve having a decent personal password manager like Kipa6, which is really not good U U UX-wise. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, I agree but completely. But it's, uh, it seems uh, not clear right now if this should be Seahorse on another application. So. Yeah, like it's it's up for discussion when you want to centralize all the secret stuff, single manager. Uh, you know, you use SSH keys for authenticating Unix accounts, basically, or Unix-ish things. And you use GPG key for, for signing binary blobs of data. And your passwords, your, your website password or application passwords really have nothing to do with that. So they're kind of related in that it's sensitive material that you want to keep very private, very secure. But the the things you do with each of those things, SSH keys, GPG keys, and passwords, are not really the same. I'm I'm not sure if having them in a single application is, is the right thing to do. I don't know. Definitely carrying them around between the devices, it's completely the same thing. So I don't know. Anyone else? Yes. Back there, back, back there. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about the Google Summer of Code project uh, that has to do with the GPG keys? Um, I think for me, when I use GPG for email, um, I have a tendency, so sometimes I'll use it for a little while and then I won't have to use GPG for like six months and I'll forget the password. And then I'll make a new GPG key. And what I've found is that using, thun I use Thunderbird and when I use Thunderbird, it's really hard to figure out how to um, delete a GPG key and put in a new one. The whole user interface, like setting everything up is really awful. And um, it's just, I think that there's a big barrier to people using GPG because there's no good user interface. Oh yeah, even even the GPG model itself is really, really bad for users. So private keys, public keys, which ones should you share, which ones you shouldn't? Why do I need someone's public key to send them email? The, the, the first time a friend sent me encrypted email, he encrypted it with his public key, so I, I couldn't decrypt it and I'm like, dude, and he's like, what? I encrypted it. Anyway, yeah, uh, about this Summer of Code project, uh, I don't think it will help with your case, uh, for example, about using a new key in, in Thunderbird. It's more, oh, we're, we, we're out of time. Anyway, it's more about, uh, is instead of exchanging fingerprints by hand so that you can sign each other's keys, I think it shows you like a QR code that you can just shoot and then that uses it to verify. It, it is very cute. It's very cute. Okay, we seem to be out of time. So thanks for attending and we can continue. Our